Hello. <clears throat> okay, I'm just gonna let people join us and we'll get our artist, our featured artist today to join in. Hello, hello. Um, today we're gonna be talking with one of our photographers, Tori. So I'm just gonna wait for her to join us and then I'm gonna add her in here and we will get started. We're gonna take a look around her office studio space, talk to her about just the all the amazing things that go into her photography process. Um, so we'll give her a minute to join us. There we go. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. How are you? Yeah. I'm good. 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 All right. So to everybody watching, uh, my name is Christine. I do marketing for Sorrel Gallery. Today we are talking to Tori Gagné. Did I say it right? Yeah, that's All fine. Right. All right. That 10 years of French finally <laughs> kicked in for me. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk to Tori today all about her process. We're going to get a little sneak peek into her kind of studio workspace. Um, and just a quick note, if anyone, as we're going through the questions and kind of like discussion evolving, if you have any questions that pop up, pop them in the comment section and I will do my best to have them answered for you. Um, so I think today we're going to start off, um, Tori, you can just take us on a little tour. You can kind of kick us, kick us off today. So, um, you know, as a photographer, you basically have an office because most of my process is done digitally. Although I will show you some of the things that I do by hand. Um, your gallery doesn't carry them because they're they're kind of uh, one off, you know, custom order things. But so um, I'll just start with the corner here. Um, this image is called She Waits and it's a gilded image where I I don't know if you can see that very well. Yeah, I, I um, print my photos on vellum, or um, it's called a Nuru paper. It's a mulberry paper that, that has plant fibers in it. And then I um, tape off the back and put white gold on the back. Usually you can do silver or um, a higher percentage of gold, but I like the subtleness of the um, white white gold because it's got some silver and it. it's just a, a more subtle um, look. And I'll show you uh, that same image when we get around to my workspace. Um, this is my, my horse, Glacier. He's a off the track uh, thoroughbred, a descendant of secretary. He's a grandson who is 27. Wow. So I think that he's He's kind of just a rescue now and lives a nice life out at a local barn here with 12 other geldings who he's very attached to. Um, and this image is from, a, it's two stallions at a rescue in California. Wow. And so these two, um, the one up top is called The Road Less Traveled and it's on the Pryor Mountains in Montana. Um, taken with a lens that kind of blurs the edges and makes the kind of um, ethereal dreamy look. Yeah. And then th this is a stallion, Noble Grace from that same herd area, which is one of my uh, favorite images. Can everyone see that with the writing that is showing up on the screen or? That one I think you need to zoom to take a little bit of a step back it's been fine so far but this yeah okay just to get the because we can't see the but we can't see like his nose and below <laughs> oh okay there Sorry, you go there now you go. we got him yeah. yeah okay um and then this one is called capriccio he's a mexican ranch horse i was down there at a ranch shooting a few years ago which is also a gilded photograph and they're obviously smaller than my other work because they're handmade and that's on vellum with white gold on the back. And he's at Appaloosa. And this one is called Isidore Cruce. It's printed on um, aluminum. Sorry, it's hard for me to get the camera right. She's a rescue at a sanctuary in 
California that I have visited several times um, and the woman there has taken, it's called Return to Freedom and she's been um, taking in wild horses for, I don't know how many years, a long time. She'll take big groups of herds and that are getting taken off the wildlands and give them a pretty uh, close to wildlife as possible there. And then she has some rescues too. Mm -hmm. And then these three are from, they're all gilded photographs from the um, Sombrero Horse Drive that they do in Northern Colorado. It's near Steamboat Springs, if anyone's a skier or the little town of Craig. And they, this ranch has all the horses that they lease out to ski areas and they let them out on the range for the winter. And then in the spring, you can go watch them, bring them all in, and they get all these amazing rodeo, real rodeo guys that, that ride, and they wear all their beautiful Western garb, and they're amazing riders, and so you can, as a photographer, they take you in a truck, and you can go along and photograph them, and it's one of the coolest things I've ever done, because there's 600 horses running. It takes a couple of days for them to do it. Um, they go like 30 miles a day, and it's really fun. And then over here, this is a dressage horse I took in Italy, just a classic neck shot with the braids. I don't know if you can see that. Yep. Yep. And then this is another practice that I do. This one's called In the Magnolias, and it's also printed on aluminum. And it's a rescue horse from a sanctuary that I, I do some work with plants. I used to be a garden designer and ran a business for 17 years in that world. So I've take, I have a lot of imagery of plant material. And then I do in camera um, layering and you can set your camera to pick up the blacks, the darks or the lights, and you don't know what you're going to get. And so I, I did some of that. And then I took the horse and then in Photoshop, I put them all together. So it becomes a collage and um i think it's really beautiful it's a little more abstract and different from what i normally do and then this one below is from the An anarchy basin in utah it's two young bachelors um sparring which is a behavior that they do to kind of practice like all wild animals do um practice for being a, a big guy where you might steal in the wild they live in families and so they try to get a harem basically uh, it's called a family band and they'll have several mayors and some lieutenant stallions on the edges who are usually younger bachelors who kind of watch out for their group family and so these are two are young younger ones just sparring mm -hmm. and then um this is my workspace i'm work this let me see if you can see this image on my computer. Sorry. <laughs> this is from a recent trip to the Spring Creek Basin herd management area in Colorado, which is near a little town called Naturita, where I found this camp. It's kind of like a mini Burning Man camp, and we stayed in a glamping tent there. It was super cool. They brought us meals because I'd be up before sunrise and not back until eight or nine at night and our meals would be waiting. They had somebody there at the camp that cooked and it was really, really a fun little spot. Um, and then I went out on the range every day for three days and it was just beautiful. I'd never been there before. Just west of uh, Telluride, Colorado, on the western, western side of Colorado. And then just a couple more images behind my desk. Um, in the video, in the reel that you made, this, <laughs> this image that you're seeing is, um, there was a picture of my camera next to a white Jeep, just the front of the Jeep, and yeah. it was green, but this is where that image was taken. And in that, in the reel you made, you can't see the horse, you can kind of see the horses, and then this one went up on the, on the ridge by himself, and I was, you know, I was almost going to give up because they were so far away. And then it actually has become a really popular and favorite image of mine. Um, and then over here is my space where I do work by hand. Hmm. 
And this is an image of hellebores. Um, that's a layered image. I, I put them on layers of glass um, with space in between and then shoot down through it to get the different layers. This is a little different than my in-camera technique. And it's on um, mulberry paper, which I don't know if you can see the fibers in there. You see there are little um, plant fibers that give it a little interesting look. And then I'll put um, gold leafing on the back of that. And this is an example of a horse. It's a horse from a dressage farm down in Ocala, Florida, where I've gilded this and you can see how shimmery it is. Mm -hmm. And then the back, back, this is what the back looks like when um, you see that. It's, oh, yeah. So you tape it off and then you, you use a special um, water-based medium to, to put the sheets of gold on it. And then... Whoopsie. It um, turns out like that. And this is the same one that I showed you on the wall called She Waits. And same thing. You can see kind of the shimmer that it gets. And that's the back. Very cool. And it's, yeah, it's cool. And then these are the my brushes and the pieces of gold are just these little squares. They're super delicate. And you can see there's little pieces. They turn into flakes if you're not careful. So it's um, a delicate process to do. But, um, and then there's my, I don't know if you can see. Can you see my dog? <laughs> we can. There's Tucker. He's a Leon Burger. He's 13 years old. And Aww. yeah, not sure how long he's going to last. But he's always in here with me. Oh, a good studio, oh. a loyal studio assistant. We love yeah. that. <laughs> so, perfect. That's yeah. amazing. Well, so um, I want to talk, you kind of, I want to go back a little bit because you talked about um, you had a landscaping business and sort of like you've got this knowledge of, of botanicals and things like that. So I want to like scoot back a little bit back to that. And I'd love if you could talk to us a little bit more about from there, or maybe even prior to that or during that time, how did how did you end up with your current style, your current medium? Um, and just remind us where you're located as well, just so that we know kind of like your ge your geography yeah. that you're working with. I'm in a suburb outside of Minneapolis. It's called Excelsior. And it's um it's it's not it's pretty well populated, but there's a lot of nature around, so mm -hmm. lots of parks and places to get out, um, which I do frequently. It's about a half an hour outside of, west of Minneapolis. Okay. So, um, but, you know, I kind of fell into the, the garden design thing. A friend of mine and I started a business when I think I was 18 and she was 17. Oh. And we started weeding people's gardens around the garden. <laughs> We've got the rosters from local country clubs and just put flyers in their mailboxes. And we didn't really even know what we were doing. And we called ourselves the Garden Girls. And oh, I, um, I ended up doing that for 17 years um, until wow. I, had, I had one, I kept doing it with my first child. Uh, and then I had a set of twins two and a half years later and I sold it to the four women that worked for me. And prior to that, my partner and I had split up. So we were each on our own so that we would stay friends. <laughs> and, uh, she still runs her business today for so like 40 years. It's amazing. So that's where I got my affinity. And I did a lot of garden design classes and horticulture classes. That wasn't what I studied in college. I studied uh, at first, I studied political science and um, art history, really. Um, and then I just filled in with horticulture classes here and there. But um, the reason photography is such a big piece of my life is that my mother was a super creative person. She died about a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And she was always creating things, my, um, always with her hands. And so she built a, my brother built her a dark room in our basement, which he used. And I was 12, I think, when that happened. And so I would just go down there and 
mess around with it. And we also, when I was in elementary school, uh, I remember in, I think, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, we got to do photography. And there was a dark room in my school there. And we had some really amazing uh, teachers who are all famous photographers now. And at that time, I had no idea. But, um, you know, that sparked my interest. And I think in high school, too, it was a, a place to go just get away. And it's quiet and dark in there. And you could just watch the images develop and that was just there and I I didn't know that that was going to become part of my life until later although I'd always taken a lot of pictures and then how the horse while the horse thing started is you know I I stayed home with the kids for till they were I guess in high school and college and then decided to go back and get a BFA in photography and in fine art photography so I did that and while I was doing that process I had bought and I always loved horses and had a horse my daughter had a horse and loved animals and as did my mother she had a couple of horses as a as a child too and so I had bought this book about wild horses and it was a big coffee table book and I you know I don't really I just picked it up because I was interested in it and it just sat on my coffee table for a long time and then I started reading in there about this sanctuary in uh, California return to freedom that I mentioned earlier and so um, I just went there on a whim to a photography thing that they have them frequently but it was um, I think it was five days long and you get to go with the woman Netta DeMaio who who runs it and hike in the hills with all the wild horses and it's just this amazing magical experience and I never looked back after that <laughs> So, um, and I think that's happened to a lot of, there's a lot of, um, a lot of us that do wild horse photography, lots of, a lot of women love horses and I think a lot have just seen them once and then just become enchanted and in awe of the whole story behind them and that's how it all started. So I just started shooting them and um, just kept working at it and decided that that was what I was going to do. Mostly, you know, I do my other stuff too, but yeah, landscape stuff, but that, yeah, that's, that's funny. Um, it feel like your story feels like decades in the making and incredibly sudden all at once. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I, I'm, I'm a person who jumps in, uh, two feet first yeah. and doesn't think a lot about it. Just go for that's it. Nice. And, um, yeah, so that's awesome. Yeah. So um you know you're you've mentioned reservations you've mentioned sanctuaries you've mentioned kind of being out in the wild so this i think is like the big question can you walk us through like just like a a, a loose idea of your process of picking a spot getting out there what is what does a day look like for you on a shoot um, well, picking a spot, I think the first place I went to was the Anaki Basin, which is um, south of Salt Lake City. And um, I have long family connections with Salt Lake City from skiing, and my sister lives in Park City. And so it was kind of a, a thing, well, I can kill two birds with one stone, visit her, and then also go down to this, this um, area. And it's it's easily accessible on dirt. They're dirt roads, but it's uh, maybe only... 45 minutes south of Salt Lake City. And then once you get on the dirt roads, it's a, a ways out there to get to the horses. Mm -hmm. But it's on an old Pony Express road that's that's ma maintained, and which is also interesting because you can stop and see the, the history of that. There's plaques and stuff. But um, so I think that's, I went there the first time just because it was easy. And I went by myself, which I, I, I do sometimes. Um, I'm very independent. And I love adventure. So um, I would just go out there. And I had learned from other photographers. A lot of us speak to each other about where to go, how to find the horses. And those horses at that time, I can't remember the year that I first went, were pretty habituated to humans. Um, I don't think they had been rounded up yet by a helicopter, so they weren't afraid. Although I did notice like when an, there, these, the public lands are all multi-use, so you'll see ATVs and other people out there. There's hunters sometimes. Um, but 
so sometimes when they hear an ATV, that, that rushing noise, they'll get startled. Okay. Um, and I haven't been back since there was a big roundup, I think three years ago. I haven't been back to see how they, how they are. But a lot of times if they hear a plane or a helicopter, they'll, they'll take off. But anyway, so um, that was the first place I picked. And I, I just, um, there's a, I stayed in Tooele, which is a local town, but a lot of people, you can camp out there if you want. I did not do that, but it's just, a, it was a really magical thing to do. And you just are in awe the first time you see them. It's absolutely amazing. And it's also this, this sort of, um, not crushing silence, but it's just a heavy silence of being out there that none of us, you know, we always have background noise in our lives and it's really hard to not be, to be in a place where there's zero noise. And it's, it's, it's really, um, feels really cool to have that. Yeah. So, and if I'm going to another place for the first time, I will always find other photographers who've been there who might tell me where the water holes are. Sometimes they can send you GPS coordinates. Um, you can get maps from the Bureau of Land Management, but they're not to scale, and I find them kind of not very useful, except just to kind of get a, a feel for where this place is in the larger landscape. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, uh, yeah, and sometimes you go and you don't find them, and it's frustrating, but it's part of the, and they might be just in a draw, like, the landscape looks flat, but there's like a, a draw and they could be down below and you wouldn't know. Right. And it happened to me before too. And then all of a sudden they'll come up and go, Oh, there they are. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So, uh, cool. and then, so then I'll go, I'll, I'll usually do a sunrise. I might stay all day and just hang out depending on how close I am to where I'm staying. If I'm camping, I would obviously just be there, but I usually try to shoot in you know before 10 o'clock in the morning and then after um probably after three in the afternoon until through sunset yeah gotcha yeah so is there any place that you haven't been that you really want to go i'm almost thinking like internationally because there's so much of so much of what you're what you've uh shot has been like the american west is there anywhere else in the united states or internationally that you really this like a bucket list look uh uh, destination for you well i have a bucket list of of going to see i think they're called the garano horses in in portugal mm -hmm. where they're doing a rewilding project and um i just read about it i don't know a whole lot about it um but i know another um, photographer friend of mine was just leading a group out there and so i'll probably talk to her and um you know i don't know in the next couple of years i'd love to go yeah do that and then also go see the um the Lusitanos in uh, southern Spain and in oh. Antarctica and, and do all that. And maybe even the Portuguese horses. I'd have to get some access to the barns. But I think that would be uh, definitely a bucket list thing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, what do you, I mean, you talked a lot about um, the, you talked about the, the sort of like, odd silence you know we are modern you know living in a we're we're, we're like cavemen living in a modern <laughs> society yeah. with this constant yeah. like humming of like phones ringing and cars driving and all this stuff but i mean so may, maybe this maybe that's it that like sort of like connect and disconnect at the same time but what is is there something is that it or is there something else that you would pinpoint as kind of the 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 most rewarding part of your process um, yeah, I think it's, it's a combination of things. It's a, it's, it's the thrill of, of looking and searching for something and finding it, mm -hmm. being out in nature and sometimes camping, sometimes not, and just, you know, being dressed for that. And, um, just that it's a, and it's a, it's an adventure each time. And every time I'm done shooting at a certain place, I just, I can't stop. I'm like, oh, I don't want to go yet. I, we, this can't be, it can't be over. Yeah. And where you get this like, yeah. or, oh, I didn't get the shot I wanted and, you know, all that. So, and part of it is the awe of being out in that landscape and the beauty and wonder of seeing wild horses. You might see, you can see all kinds of um, other wild animals. There's sage grouse, there's mule deer, 
the elk, uh, pronghorn antelope, coyotes. I've seen cat prints. I've never seen a cat, but I saw a really big <laughs> lion, and that's their main predator. Um, and I, you know, they're so elusive, but, uh, and I haven't seen bears, but I'm sure they're out yeah. there. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. Um, so, and then, and then the, the, of course, the next question is going to be, what's the most, what's the most challenging part of this process for you? I think, um, having to drive super slow on the dirt roads and some of them are super rocky and very narrow in certain places. And my husband's really good and he loves to drive four wheel trucks and stuff. Oh, and his good. That's, that that's a match made in heaven. <laughs> I didn't have him I'd probably have to hook up with someone else that knows how to do that because there's places where you would just not go by yourself right um, so that's challenging is sometimes thinking oh no we might not be able to get through this particular area or um, or and then you might have to like back up because a lot of times there's not a place to to turn around either um, so that's challenging um, the weather can be challenging um, you know not finding the horses at the at, at the good light time and then all of a sudden they show up or you find them in a year in the middle of the day and so that morning has been wasted um but i guess i guess those are the most challenging things and i think this the saddest thing is when you can't find them and you have to just give up but yeah. that's only happened to me once but usually usually oh, I'll that's a pretty them. good track record <laughs> <laughs> it's not bad at all yeah. <laughs> i thought it was like 50% of the time you get out there and you're like, well, pack it up. <laughs> no, no, that's not even, no, one area I went to this plateau in, in um, Wyoming outside of Rollins and I, there's a wild horse loop there. And I didn't realize that they had taken all the horses off of this place. I don't know if they're in holding or what, but so they're like, you know, where are they? And I just think they were taken off the land and I didn't know. So, yeah. Uh. Um, so, I mean, I, I know, um, you were talking about how sometimes the horses are, um, skittish if they hear a helicopter or an ATV or something like that. So, you know, how do you, um, how do you approach that? I mean, is there, is there a substantial period of time where you're kind of trying to gain their trust and inching close? Sir, I mean, do you, you know, how close do you get? How do you how do you figure out how to not spook the horses? And and you know, I mean, it's funny. Like wild, I I've seen videos of wildlife photographers. You know, they're like in the ground, you know, and there's like a prairie dog on their head or something because they've kind of just like blended in with with the landscape. And animals have kind of gone, oh, this is not a threat. I have no idea how long that would take, depending on the species and the, the you know, yeah, the, the history for the species of like human interaction and things like that. So how, how does that go for you? Is it is it tough? Or do you kind of, are they, are they typically kind of very okay with you being there with your camera and your car? You know, it, it depends on the place that you go. Um, they, there's a lot of places where they're protected with sort of a public private partnership with um, advocacy groups that use um, uh, a vaccine called PZP, which is a fertility drug that, that they dart the females with, the mares. And so then they are infertile for a couple of years and, th and it really works. It's, it's safe and it's humane and it doesn't change the behavior of the herd dynamics. And so, um, you know, they might be wary of, of someone who's darting them, you know, because that happens. But I think certain places, if they've been rounded up by a helicopter, they are gonna be very leery of you. Um, yeah. And you can tell. And so I just keep, you can tell by, Horses kind of sense your um, the space between you, and if you get too close, they'll either change their behavior, mm. or um, and if you notice them changing your pay, their behavior, you just move back, 
and you maybe not direct eye contact and you know i'm not even that close but they can tell that you're looking at them and so you might look away or turn a shoulder um and just have a little less um a less forceful like posture you know kind of shrinking yourself and and just moving really slowly mm -hmm. and i don't try to get too close i have a big lens and um you know, it depends on where I am. If I'm in a place where they're totally used to being photographed, it's, it's, it's okay, but I wouldn't. And plus, you know, the stallions can be dangerous. They'll play with each other. And when they get in a sparring thing, they are not paying attention to what's around them. And they'll just start running after each other really, really fast. And sometimes they'll get in a real fight and it, it can be, it's fun to watch, but it's, it can be frightening. Yeah. Um, too close to them. Right definitely don't want to be around that um because they can you know they they'll come after you too i've never had obviously had that happen i don't know anyone who has but if they feel that you're too close they might come and chase you and they can run pretty fast yes yeah, faster faster than a human from yeah. <laughs> um so just so to clarify so what's the you mentioned two things one is horses get rounded rounded up by helicopters the other was um darting them for to make them infertile for a few years what's yeah. the purpose of those two human interventions let's call them <laughs> well uh our government had well first of all there's a there's a law that was created in the 1971 the the wild free roaming horse and burrow act which was to protect them in perpetuity as and a symbol of the American pioneer West. And so they're supposed to be um, protected by our government, but there's so much pressure from, I think a lot of it is, is from the cattle ranching and sheep ranching. They get, they get cheap grazing rights on public land. So it's like really doesn't cost them anything really to graze them. So there's a competition for that land that you know, there's, there's numbers of animals, it's called the appropriate management level. And so they can have a certain number of horses and a certain number of cow calf pairs on a particular piece of, of land. And the cows really get, cows and sheep get 80% of the forage and the horses are left with what's left. And so the government has, for whatever reason, decided that helicopter rounds up are the best way to do it and it's very uh inhumane it's brutal they they fly low um they a lot of them are hurt during this process because they when they run them in they'll have these these burlap shoots and then they go into a, a fenced in corral that's never big enough and they, these horses are out in the wild and then now all of a sudden their family is in with someone else's family and the stallions and eventually they'll separate them but it's very um it's really brutal yeah. what they do. And so, I mean, in my mind, I think the, the, vac the PZP vaccine is, is a really great solution. And I know there's um, groups of advocates that volunteers that learn to do the darting and they use photographers to, to um, document the, all the different courses so they know which mares have been darted in which areas. And it's usually an advocate group that's, that lives and works in each herd area. So they really know the horses well by, by um, you know, their physical looks. And so they'll use this darting process. And I think it's been pretty successful in areas where the horses are um, accessible. Um, and I know I've heard of some, some um, using uh, former military too as a, as a, you know, they're good sharpshooters to help learn, they'll know learning how to do that. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's a good solution or they can do bait trapping too. If they really do need to take them off the land, they can uh, bait trap them with hay, which is much more humane, humane if they humane. Need to take them off the land. Yeah, and then I'm sure in some places, you know, the, the, the land may not be as healthy as it, as it could be because it's usually it's overgrazed by the cattle in my opinion, but there's controversy around that. But so, um, you know, I think that's a solution and sanctuaries, more sanctuaries, more big tracts of land than someone who is willing to take that on. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. Yes, it did. It did, definitely. 
Um, it's so funny whenever whenever someone asks like, did that answer your question? I'm always like, yeah, you did. You people, <laughs> you did. no one ever knows, and it's what you did. <laughs> like starting to see like a repetitive <laughs> trend now that I've done enough of these. You absolutely answered the question. So I do want to touch. Um, I want to take a quick sidestep. The the wild horses are. Um, you know, obviously a huge interest because so much goes into tracking them down and you're with a wild animal and, and, and all these things, but you do have other series of photography. So I want to take like a really quick, just a moment to ask you, for anyone who's watching who hasn't seen Tori's other photography there, she's got wild horses and, and at Sorel we carry actually three different series of photography. One is kind of the, these coastal, abstract coastal um, pieces that are, still and serene and and there's sort of like horizontal lines it looks almost like a horizontal ripple kind of effect it's really interesting and then and then there's another series of kind of tree branches that have been abstracted and layered over one another um not sure if that's digital or not but um so the, the question is like with these three different series of work of photography for you like is there, do you find that there's really a through line between all three, you know, from all one to the next to the next, or does it feel to you like they just all scratch different itches and they're just, you know, they're just different, for, you know, in terms of your personal, what inspires you? Maybe they're all totally isolated and that would be interesting. I'd like to hear what you think. I think they are related in some way with my affinity for nature. Um, but I do think that I also have, like the horses are very, um, you know, real straight photography basically. Um, and the other two series are much more abstract and I have always had an affinity for abstract art. And so I, whenever I, you know, I want, it's, it's almost like whenever I travel, I just try to figure out what is the opportunity to, to make some images. So because I live in Minnesota, it's freezing here in the winter and a lot of people try to get to the ocean yeah. if they or somewhere warm. So I'll always go try to make some images. And we also, um, Lake Superior is three hours away, two and a half hours north. And it's absolutely stunning because it's very moody with the different weather that you get. And so I've made a lot of images up there as well. Mm -hmm. And it, it's in camera movement and slow shutter speeds and then um basically you know just tweaking them a little bit in photoshop and then with the trees that came about um i took a class from valda bailey who's um really good be makes beautiful abstract work with in-camera layering and she's the one who taught me how to how to do that and so you were layering the photographs with multiple images inside your camera choosing lights or darks and it's how i explained before that you you really don't know what you're going to get and then i will take those into photoshop and layer them again so they become it's it's a multi-layer process mm -hmm. and then some of those then i take from there and use the the gold um gilding on the back of them depending on the image because it has to have enough light areas for me to want to put the gold on the back so that you, you can see that shimmer through and, and i think the the uh, water series and the tree series all have sort of an ethereal effect that i like um so i think it's all tied together with my affinity for nature but then the, then the horses are a little bit separate in just the style of photography that it is and it allows me to do both kinds and i love trying new things um i'm always learning um yeah. i always taking it a class you know to learn from some other photographers whether i use it or not but it all informs what i do yeah yeah so uh if you could give one piece of advice to your younger self as an artist what would it be i think just to go for it if you want to follow i mean i've always followed my passions and luckily i've been able to do that i think or even even if you can't but have that to myself 
even keeping a practice, if you have a day job, you know, you, then maybe you don't have as much time to, to jump in, but just keep doing a, doing, a, doing a hobby and turn it into something if that's what you really love. And then the persistence I think is, is huge. Just keep working and, and, and uh, finding people who can help you getting your work in front of the right people and, and not giving up because it's really, there's a lot of rejection. And if you just keep at it, stuff will start to, to happen for you, positive attitude. And I think for me, I, I have a positive outlook and I can do attitude. And, and that's what I would tell my younger self, not to be afraid. And I'm still afraid to put my work out, you know? Yeah. It's an art thing. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, um, and then lastly, if, if you can do, I'm, I'm going to challenge you. If you can do it in five words or less, but if you can't, that's fine. What's your goal as an artist? Oh, five words yeah. or less. I don't know. Yeah. This, is, um, this is a hard one. And I put you on the spot with this. One. It's totally like, but I like, I, sometimes I like the challenge because it's, it really makes you kind of go, huh? Uh, I would just say, keep moving forward. The, did it in three. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> keep keep making on. work and keep moving forward. Yeah. And not let yourself get stagnant. Yeah. Cool. So we're going to, we're, we've been talking for 40, almost 45 minutes now. So, oh my God. um, yeah, time, no the idea. time goes quick on, on IG live. <laughs> um, but I want to, so I, we're going to wrap up, but I want to do a little something different really quickly. Um, we're just going to do a quick this or that to, to finish up our talk today. So, um, are you a morning person or a night person? Morning for sure. I, I don't wait. know if yeah. you could, I feel like you have to be to, to, to be a wild horse. <laughs> well, I don't like getting up at three in the morning, but I, I will, but yeah. um, I'm definitely, I can't wait for the day to start every day. I love every day. Nice. Um, cats or dogs? Both. I have both and I, I would both pick one over the other maybe maybe a little bit dogs over cats because okay. take them for walks <laughs> right right um coffee or tea coffee for sure mountains or ocean mountains all right and in the spirit of halloween because it is next week snickers or almond joy uh probably snickers but i do like the coconut in the almond joy for sure okay. and pumpkin carving or apple picking pumpkin carving Okay. Do you guys do you guys have a lot of apple picking there? Yeah, we do. do. There's, yeah. there's a lot of apple orchards here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And pumpkin, my my extended apple. family's from Michigan, and I know they have they have orchards oh, yeah. out there. And yeah. 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 There's a lot. Um, of I, I mean, I'm in upstate New York, so like I'm surrounded by, <laughs> by apples all the time. So I'm yeah. like, are there apples in other areas? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, all right, so, but you're still sure. you're still gonna pick pumpkin carving. That's your that's your I think preferred. So I mean, I love I like carving pumpkins and I have a little grandson who's two and we carved his first pumpkin this year and he oh, was looking at nice. the and awesome. was really cute. Does, yeah. Do, does does the does your grandchild live near you and yeah. you're able to uh, yeah he lives about half an hour uh, away so I get to see him. Oh even better. Okay. Yeah. Um all right if you could be any animal what would you be? Um I think I may be a cat <laughs> because they are independent and they get to do what they want. Yeah. <laughs> I love that answer, and I I was, I will be honest, I was kind of expecting you to say a horse, because you have horses and you photograph them, and you know. But I actually love your answer because you've mentioned multiple times that you're independent, and that is a cat. <laughs> that is cat through and through. <laughs> um, and what is your favorite place on earth? Uh, I think right where I am, home. I love that. Yeah. All right. That's a perfect home, way to end. Wherever home may be. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. Well, Tori, thank you so, so, so much for talking today. Um, Welcome. I, it's so funny. I, I know nothing about photography. I was a fine art major, so I can talk about painting, but never photography. I've always been like completely confused by it. Um, I love talking to photographers. Um, well, I'm talking about every type of artist, but photography is so interesting because your day is so unconventional trying to trying to capture these moments. So um, I learned a lot. Um, I hope everybody else did too. 
And um, this is going to get posted. So if you missed pieces or if you came in late, come back and watch the whole thing and look out for our blog. We're going to have the written version of the blog um, go up and uh, you'll get to see lots of extra photos and videos of, of Tori at work. And if you have not watched our reel um, and you're interested, go back and check our reel where we gave a little bit of a sneak preview a couple of days ago of Tori at work, which I was so excited to see kind of what the what the landscape actually looks like because you're actually seeing like a real behind the scenes you look at tori's work and it's striking but very often it's close up and it's and it's the horse when you zoom out and you see all that stuff it, it just gives it so much more it just gives you context that makes it even better so um tori do you have anything you want to say before we sign up no just thank you Thank you so much. I really enjoyed speaking with you and yeah. it went by way faster it, than I thought. It always does. It always <laughs> goes by really fast. I, like, I, I keep an eye on the time and I'm always like, geez. like usually I'll check it and it's been like 30 minutes and I'm like, okay, that felt like five, but okay, let's do this. So yeah, it is always, it's, it's quick. Good. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody. So, and we will see you later and have a great rest of your week and a happy Halloween. Yeah, you too. <laughs>